Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Nikki Hamm. Dr. Nikki Howe, and I would like to introduce you to a remarkable scientist called Marie Tharp. She was hired by Lamont University in 1948, and while she worked with Bruce Heasine, she produced the first map of the ocean floor, despite not being allowed to work aboard ship until 1965 because she was a woman. We join Marie as she unveils her incredible map for the very first time in 1977. Well, it all began in Victorian England. In 1841, Edward Forbes sailed the Mediterranean, searching the deep waters for life. He concluded that there was no life below 300 fathoms. A fathom is uh, the reach of an average sailor, so it's about six feet. 300 fathoms is about half a kilometer or a third of a mile. Now, Absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence. Forbes would have done well to remember that just because he didn't find any life did not mean that there wasn't any. I'd just like to defend Forbes here slightly. Even though his theory was flawed, it was enthusiastically accepted by learned Victorian society for many years. And actually, it wasn't until after his death that it was seriously challenged by the Scottish naturalist Charles Wyville Thompson. Oh, Charles Wyville Thompson, now that was a man with a scientific mind. Yes, well, Charles went on his own cruises and he discovered life around the British Isles as deep as 2,300 fathoms. Right, Charles used his evidence to persuade the Royal Society in London to launch the world's first scientific research cruise to circumnavigate the globe. In 1872, HMS Challenger set sail. It came back four years later with 492 soundings and over 4,700 new species of life. I have to say, this is actually incredibly impressive for the time. This was a time when soundings or depth measurements were made with a, with a rope that had a weight on the end that was literally thrown off the side of a ship and then they just counted how long it took for the rope to hit the bottom. The observations from the Challenger started to reveal interesting things below the surface. They noticed a plateau in the middle of the Atlantic and it was this mid-Atlantic ridge that got me and Bruce involved in the story. In 1952, we had tens of thousands of soundings, gathered since 1946. It was my job to turn this interminable list of numbers into a detailed and accurate map of the ocean floor. Hang on, I got a minute, Marie. <laughs> tens of thousands of soundings in six years when HMS Challenger couldn't even manage 504. This was only possible because of the development of continuous echo sounding in World War II. This process involves using a sound signal, normally an electronic ping, that's sent out from the ship. When it bounces off the sea floor, the echo is then recorded by a microphone on board and a mark is made on a piece of paper that's on a continuous stream of paper. Hester and I calculated the depths from the soundings and plotted the topography along the ship's course. Hester Herring was Marie's long-suffering assistant. I noticed immediately that there was only one match-up, a rift running right down the middle of the ridge. I had found evidence of continental drift, but continental drift was not in vogue. So I had trouble convincing Bruce. He actually said my interpretation was, girl, talk. <laughs> he did eventually accept my evidence some eight months later. 
We decided we wanted everyone to visualize the ocean floor as we saw it. So in 1957, we produced the first physiographic map of the North Atlantic. A physiographic map. It shows the terrain from above as if you were flying over it in a plane. And Marie had the idea of doing the same with the ocean, but as if all of the water had been drained away. I admit that we had to make some educated guesses where we had little data. And where we had no data at all, we put a big legend. I wanted to include mermaids and shipwrecks, but Bruce would have none of it. The next step was obvious, to paint a panorama of the entire ocean floor. These maps were actually works of art, as well as being scientifically accurate. They were painted by an Austrian artist called Heinrich Baran. Establishing the Rift Valley and finding the Mid-Ocean Ridge, which travels 40,000 miles around the Earth. That was important. You can't find anything bigger than that. Not on this planet, anyway. It seems fitting to me that I am presenting this final map to you at a time when Earth observation is entering a new era. The first satellite to measure sea surface height from space was launched in 1975. This worked in a similar way to the echo sounder, but used radio waves instead of sound waves. By removing effects of winds, waves and currents, you get an impression of the sea floor. Now, even though we have a lot more data today, and we can even use computers to make our maps for us, in 2014, a new map was published with a resolution of five kilometers. And that means that we can see features that are larger than five kilometers only. We have a map of the entire surface of Mars to a resolution of 100 meters. So that means that still today, we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about the bottom of the ocean. But thanks to Marie Tharp, we know that it's worth looking and to continuously improve on her maps of the deep. Thank you.